Hello, this is the introduction to the pre-lab for heat conduction. Uh, I'd like you to follow along with your lab write-up. If we start out with uh, the beginning, it says in the, in the introduction, it says, uh, basically if we boil it down, we're going to be asked to measure the thermal conductivity of an unknown sample. And we, the, it states that we're 15% uh, desired uncertainty. We're going to have to check to see if we can get that. And then it says, uh, ask us uh, to develop a mathematical model for radial heat conduction. So first of all, we're going to need to determine the uncertainty, I mean, the, we're going to need to determine the thermal conductivity of the unknown sample in the lab. Uh, then once we calculate that uncertainty, then we're going to have to, uh, once we calculate that conductivity, then we're going to calculate the uncertainty. Now, it says that it needs to be plus or minus 15%. Whether it is or not, we don't know yet. We'll calculate it. Whatever it is is what we get, and we'll report whatever that uncertainty is. If it's greater than 15%, we'll make some recommendations on how to improve that uncertainty. And then finally, we're asked to develop a mathematical model for radial heat conduction. Uh, we have a mathematical model for radial heat conduction that we developed in class, and it's already in the book. And then we can use our experimental data to tweak that model if necessary to uh, make it match what the uh, actual circumstances are. I'd like to begin by showing you a schematic of the apparatus. Okay, here we have the linear heat conduction apparatus. Up here at the top, we have a heating element. This material around the sides here is all brass, and then we have insulation surrounding the outside of it. Down here at the bottom, we have uh, cooling water that comes in that circulates through to cool it at the bottom. So we have um, a temperature gradient from the top down to the bottom, and we have a heat flux that's going through it. Okay, so we have a heating section with brass in it. Then we have our sample section, which could be either brass or the unknown material. And then we have a cooling section, which is also made of brass. The apparatus is instrumented with thermocouples. Each one of them uh, is spaced 15 millimeters apart. We have three in the upper section. We have two in the brass sample, T4 and T5. The other samples do not have thermocouples. And then we have three thermocouples down here in the, uh, the cooling section. And this is for the linear apparatus. For the radial heat conduction apparatus, we have this situation. We're looking at it from the side. If you look down from the top, it would look like a disc. All right. In the disc, in the center of the disc, we have a heating element. And then we have thermocouples uh, embedded into the apparatus uh, at various spacings along here that are listed in your write-up. The disc uh, is made of brass, and then at the outside, going all the way around, this is a ring that goes all the way around the disc, we have a cooling uh, water that circulates through the apparatus. Okay. So that's our equipment. All right, so let's go now and look at each one of the uh, pages in the report requirements. On page one, it asks us to write a one-page letter to the research group describing your experiment. Okay, as always, I want you to follow the format shown in the letter format on the website and frequently asked question document. The letter should not be, uh, it should not exceed one page, and obviously an uncertainty analysis is required in this report. Okay, page two, right here. Uh, basically, it says to calculate the heat flux for the apparatus with the brass sample. So we're going to use Fourier's law to do that, and I've drawn that up here on the board. The heat flux is equal to the heat rate divided by the cross-sectional area. Well, that's just equal to, from Fourier's law, the thermal conductivity divided by the length times the temperature difference. Because it's linear heat conduction, the heat flux is a constant, so we could also get it for measure between T4 and T5, and also measure between T6 and T7. We could have also measured it between T1 and T3, and that would have made this distance 2L instead of 1L. Okay, remember L is the distance between the thermocouples, and K is the thermal conductivity, and in this case, it's brass. 
Okay, I haven't used any subscripts. Later on, we'll use some subscripts. Okay, so that gives us the heat flux through the apparatus with the brass sample installed. Okay, page three asks us to draw the appropriate 1D thermal circuit between thermocouples T3 and T6, including conduction and contact resistance. And then it says use the average heat flux from page two to calculate the average contact resistance. And we'll compare this with uh, values that are listed in the, our textbook. And it says plot the temperature versus distance between thermocouples two and six. Discuss the circuit and the effects of any contact resistance. Well, this is straightforward. First of all, here's the apparatus here. Okay, if we look at it from its side, this is laying on its side. It consists of the three sections, and we have thermocouples embedded in the apparatus. Each one of them is separated by a distance um, L. Now, this distance right here, uh, between this thermocouple and this thermocouple, is L, but that we have uh, a break in the apparatus right here that will represent the uh, resistance by the contact resistance. So if we draw the circuit, we have Q coming in, we have T1, we have our first resistance, which is L over Ka, which would be here. Then we have L over Ka. Now we have L over 2 over Ka, which would be right here. Then we have the contact resistance. It goes another L over 2 over Ka. Then it goes an L over Ka, another L over 2. We have another contact resistance, which is right here, and so forth. Okay. Well, in order to, uh, we know that Q is equal to T1 minus T8 over the sum of the resistances. Well, here are all our resistances. We add all these up and we plug it in. We know what Q is, or we could uh, divide by the area and know what the heat flux is. We know that from page two. So we can solve for the contact resistance and plug that in. And what we get is a contact resistance in the units of uh, K over W. So note this contact resistance. Here's our equation right here where I said solve for RC. Now note this RC is not the RC double prime that's described in the book. Okay, RC double prime is equal to the contact resistance that you calculate here times the cross-sectional area. Or we could say the contact resistance is equal to this RC double prime, which is also called contact resistance. You have to know the context, which, whichever one we're talking about, divided by the area. So if you want to compare this with what's in the book, you're going to have to take the value you got here for this contact resistance and multiply it by the, con uh, the uh, cross-sectional area. Okay, and then you're also going to have to show a plot, to provide a plot showing temperature versus distance. Okay, page four asks us to use Fourier's law to cal calculate the average heat flux through the conduction apparatus for the aluminum sample section. So in this step, you're going to have to take the brass section out and replace it with the aluminum section. And you'll see how to do this when we get to the lab portion of the lecture. And it says specifically use the temperature gradients between 2 and 3 and T6 and T7 to calculate the heat flux. So we'll be able to measure T2 and T3 and also T6 and T7. The material between each of these uh, locations right here is brass. So we can use the thermal conductivity for brass and solve that for the heat flux. Okay, so that gives us the heat flux through the system with the uh, aluminum sample, which we're, we're going to call the aluminum sample the unknown sample. All right, page five asks us to draw the 1D circuit with the unknown sample, which is the aluminum sample. So we go through and we draw a circuit just like I did before for the brass situation. I'm going to walk back over here. Okay, so... Our circuit will look just like this, except now the first three K's are going to be K subscript BR for K brass. In the center section, we're going to have K aluminum. And then over here, we're going to have, for the last three, we're going to have K brass. Okay. 
We get the thermal, uh, we get the contact resistance. We use the same contact resistance we did over here. The contact resistance should not have changed. And so if we have the contact resistance and we know what Q is, we should be able to solve this equation for the uh, thermal conductivity of the aluminum. Okay. Page six asks us to discuss the overall uncertainty in the above analysis and probable sources of error. Show your uncertainty analysis and suggest practical ways to reduce the uncertainty. Notice it says practical ways. Okay, it has to be something that's physically possible. And be sure to discuss the most significant contribution of your uncertainty. Okay, that means that you're going to have to calculate the uncertainty uh, for uh, the thermal conductivity of aluminum. Well, you're going to do that in terms of the measurements that we made. We have the thermal conductivity of the brass. There's some uh, uncertainty associated with that. There's some uncertainty associated with the length. And there's some uncertainty associated with each temperature. So we write the equation down that we use to solve for the thermal conductivity of brass, I mean of aluminum. And then we go in just using the root sum square method, just like we always have. You're going to take the partial derivative of each measured quantity and multiply it by the uncertainty of that quantity. Okay? The uncertainty of brass. Okay? If you uh, look in a handbook or you look on the internet, you'll see quite a few va uh, possible values for the thermal conductivity of brass. First of all, we don't know what kind of brass it is. So we just have to take a uh, sampling of different thermal conductivities of brass and come up with what we think is a reasonable uncertainty. We don't know what the uncertainty in the length is. None of this is given. But we, do, we could use our uh, knowledge of uh, what you learned in manufacturing lab. You know that this thing was probably set up on a milling machine. You know that you can probably drill a hole to within a thousandth of an inch. But then you've got to put the thermal couple in and you've got to locate it. So you just have to use your own judgment to determine how close you think somebody could actually install a thermal couple, what the accuracy of that actual location is. So we know that L nominally is 15 millimeters, but it has plus or minus some amount. So use your judgment to determine how well you think that someone could have actually manufactured this device. And then finally we have T. That's the uh, temperature. Well. Again, we have no information on the uncertainty of temperature, but we do know that there are thermal couples, and we know that, for example, a typical value for uncertainty in temperature uh, would be plus or minus, say, 1.5 degrees C. Uh, you can pick whatever you want that you think is reasonable as long as you can justify it. Okay, so you're going to use the root sum square method to determine the uncertainty in all the different values that you report. Okay, now we're going to move to the, uh, the radial heat conduction. This is page 7, and it says, uh, the steady date state solution of the heat conduction equation for cylindrical coordinates yields this temperature profile. So its temperature is a function of the radial position, and it's equal to C1, the log of R, plus C2. C1 and C2 are constants. Okay, we don't know what those constants are at this point, but when we do the experiment, we'll know the temperature at various radial positions. In fact, we only have to know it at two positions, and we can determine those constants just by plugging in the radial position and the temperature, and we'll be able to get that in lab. So that gives us a mathematical model. Now, we're making measurements at, I think, five different positions, so you should be able to use all those positions and come up with a better value for C1 and C2. Okay, then it says plot a line uh, using the model. Okay, so if we plot this, if we put radial position down here on the horizontal axis and T over here, if we 
plot the model, it'll look something like that. Okay, now we're going to plot the data. Now, I don't know where your data is going to come out, but it's li unlikely that it'll lie exactly on the line. It may come out a little, you may have one here, one down here, one like that. So it'll probably lie somewhere not exactly on the line. Okay, well, if it doesn't lie, if the data doesn't ex lie exactly on the line, then our model r right now is not exactly predicting what the, uh, the output should be. So how do we know if our model is good or not? Well, we're going to have to do the uncertainty for the, uh, the temperatures. So if we plot the uncertainty of the temperatures and we use uncertainty bars, we might get something that looks like this. Okay, now within the uncertainty of the measurement, the line now passes through all the data. So we could say then the model that we have here is a good model. It predicts the data to within the uncertainty. On the other hand, if the data points, let's draw another one over here. If our model looks like this, and our data, suppose our data is sitting up here like this. Okay, well again, do we know if the data accurately models the, uh, or the, does the model accurately uh, reflect the data? Well, we have to put our uncertainty bars. Well, what if the uncertainty looked like this? Okay, our model does not pass through any of the uncertainty bars, so our model is not accurately predicting the actual temperatures. So in this case, we're going to need to tweak the model. We can either add a constant to it, we might want to change the, uh, the coefficient, C1, we might need to change C2. We're going to tweak the model until we get the model so that it accurately reflects what our measurements are. Okay, so then we, once we do that, then we have an accurate model. Okay, and then our last page, page 8, says uh, include the sample calculations. So, all right, any other calculations that you did not include anywhere else in this lab report should appear on this page. And again, whenever you do a calculation, for any kind of a lab report, you're going to want to put down sample numbers, ones that you used, put in your units and show how they canceled, and so that you came up with the uh, right units at the end. Okay, we're now going to move on and uh, do the demonstration in the lab. Thank you. This is the heat conduction apparatus. We have two pieces of equipment. We have a linear heat conduction unit down here on the lower level, and in the, meeting, uh, in the middle level we have a radial heat conduction. We'll start with the linear heat conduction. The linear heat conduction consists of an upper heating section. This comes off. There's an upper heating section up here. There's a heating element in here. Then there's a brass cylinder inside of the plastic which acts as an insulator. It's instrumented with three thermocouples. One, two, three. The center section of the linear uh, heat conduction apparatus is either our uh, reference section or our test section, our sample section. Uh, we'll start with the brass section of a known thermal conductivity, and it has two thermocouples associated with it. And then on the bottom section, we have uh, it's uh, anchored to the base there, it has three thermocouples and it has a brass section inside of it and a cooling section at the bottom. So to operate, uh, well, then we have different samples we can insert into the linear heat conduction to uh, determine the thermal conductivity. We have a brass sample, we have a stainless steel sample, and we have an aluminum sample. For this experiment, we're going to use the aluminum sample. To operate the equipment, first, for the first part of this experiment, we're going to insert the instrumented uh, brass sample into the unit. We 
want to make sure that in order to get good thermal uh, conductivity to reduce the thermal uh, the contact resistance, you want to make sure that there's thermal paste on the surfaces. Usually you can just take a little bit off the side here and just kind of dab it on there until it looks like it's good. Dab it on the other side kind of uniformly. And we put it on there. And we put the top section on and we clamp it down. probably get some thermal paste on your hands. Be sure to get that off. If this gets on your clothes, it will not come out. It will permanently damage your clothes. So anytime you see any thermal paste around, wipe it up. Keep the uh, working area clear. Next, we're going to set the cooling water to 1,000 cc's for a minute. So we turn on the water over here at the wall. And we turn, uh, we set this valve here for linear conduction and we set this to about a thousand. It's the, the, the exact amount doesn't matter as long as you keep it the same amount throughout the experiment. Okay, so now we're going to turn the power on to the uh, unit. The way you do that, there's a power cord that comes out the back. We have to plug that into the back of the unit. Okay, so we kind of have to maneuver the unit a little bit. You won't be able to see me do this but it's uh, this plug that looks a little different from your standard plug. Lean back, you'll see the place to put it. It's kind of a delicate plug, so be careful putting it in there. We're going to have to take that out later and put a different plug in. Then we can turn the unit on, and we're going to set 11 volts. With this dial right here, we can adjust the voltage, and the readout is over here. We can set we can read volts, amps, different uh, values over here. Set it to volts, and we're going to set this to 11 volts. Okay. The unit will start to heat up now. We're going to wait for steady state. Now, while that's happening, I'm going to find the thermocouples that are associated with the linear heat conduction. I'm going to plug them into the uh, HD10X heat transfer unit. So. These thermocouples are numbers, and again, they're delicate, so be very careful with them and put them into the right socket. Each one of them has a little, they're color-coded, and they have a little number on them. We'll put them into the right sockets. So they're brown, that's number one. They'll only go in one way. Uh, orange is three. also have the thermocouples off the uh, sample section in the middle, so they would correspond to 4 and 5. There's 5, and there's 4. And at this point, we just wait. We wait until the temperatures start, stop changing. We measure the temperature with this indicator right here, and it goes from T1, it's it's labeled up here. It's probably hard to see in the video. We have T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, T6. What you should be seeing is T1, since it's up there at the top, should be hotter than any of the others. Then we go to T2. It should be decreasing a little bit, and it is. And so forth. Okay. And then we just wait probably take about 15 minutes for it to come to steady state. It may take 20 minutes. Okay, so you just wait. When it finally comes to steady state, you make all your measurements. Okay, and then you take that back and you use that to determine the contact resistance and the heat flux. Okay, when you're done, we stop, we turn it off, we come over here, 
slash the unit. We remove the instrumented brass section, and we're going to call our unknown sample the aluminum sample. And we'll put that in there. You'll notice it's not instrumented, so we won't be using those thermocouples now. Look it back up. Turn the power back on. And wait. We wait until it comes to steady state again. When it comes to steady state, again, we go through and measure all our temperatures. This time we'll be measuring uh, temperatures 1, 2, and 3, and 6, 7, and 8. Okay, when you're done, turn the unit off, and now we're going to switch to the radial heat conduction. Our radial con heat conduction is this unit up here. It consists of a circular disc, there's a heating element on the inside, and there's a uh, cooling uh, ring around the outside through which cooling water circulates. So in order to get the cooling water in there, first we have to switch the valve over here to, uh, to the radial section. And again, make sure we have about a thousand cc's per minute of water flow. Now we come back over here. We need to di disconnect the linear heat conduction. We'll take that plug off and we'll install the uh, radial heat conduction plug. We put that in. Turn the unit back on and set the voltage that's specified in the handout. I have that set right here. And it will start to heat up. It will take another probably 15 minutes to heat up. So while that's happening, we'll disconnect the thermocouples from our linear heat conduction experiment. Be very careful with these. They're very expensive, hard to replace, and they're delicate. Put those down here. And we'll get the uh, thermocouples from the for the radial heat uh, conduction experiment. And again, they're numbered and color coded. So five goes here. Four. Be sure to put them into the right sockets. And we just wait again. We'll wait for about 15 minutes until it comes to steady state. You'll know it's a steady state when the temperatures stop changing. Each thermocouple will reach a steady temperature. We'll write down the temperatures. Once it comes to steady state, we'll just go through and we'll survey each of the thermocouples by turning this knob here. Then we'll uh, write those temperatures down and uh, We'll do this for two different temp uh, voltage settings. After we do that, then we'll come back up here and we'll set this to the uh, other voltage, which currently is 13 volts. We set it. Now we wait again. We wait for it to come to steady state. Once it reaches steady state, go through and measure your temperatures by turning this knob. Write them down. And then you're all done with the experiment. The last thing is to turn the uh, the unit the equipment off. So we turn the power switch off up here on the HT10X, and then we can turn the water off over here at the wall. Okay, it's okay to leave the thermocouples as they are. When you come to lab, they will either it will either be set up for radial heat conduction or linear heat conduction. Whichever one it's set up for, do that one first. And that completes the heat conduction uh, apparatus demonstration.